Good morning again, and thank you uh, very much for uh, joining us this morning. This is um, our third year of partnering with uh, Concordia, and I'm delighted to see opposite me uh, two of our partners from the very start, um, Minister Hussein, the Government of Canada, and Kelly Clements from the UNHCR. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for being willing to participate in what I hope will be a very uh, lively and enlightening uh, discussion. My name is uh, Gregory Magnatis. I'm the director of the International Migration Initiative at the Open Society Foundations. Um, I know my place here, which is to be really brief. I can look around the table and know that I am completely outmatched in terms of talent. Uh, and I know that time is closing in. We have a clock that has already started ticking with my first word. I thought it was going to start ticking before I even got here, so I'm relieved we have 89 minutes and 30 seconds left. Um, and I'm going to use them very preciously. Uh, I simply want to uh, start by introducing Minister Hussein, um, who has been uh, an incredibly um, vigorous uh, advocate uh, for refugees and migrants, um, not only um, I, since he took office, uh, and seated in the Canadian Parliament in 2015, uh, but, but for, I imagine, his entire life. Uh, he, was, uh, he fled Mogadishu for Kenya and reached Canada when he was 16. Uh, began practicing uh, criminal immigration and human rights law in his 20s, uh, entered the Canadian Parliament in 2015, and in uh, January of 2017 became uh, Minister of um, Immigration and Citizenship in, in Canada. Uh, we have had the pleasure of working with uh, Minister Hussein and his staff uh, with the Government of Canada in the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, about which you'll hear a great deal uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I just wanted to give uh, the floor to you, Minister, to uh, set us up for what we know will be a really uh, exciting day. Thank you so much, uh, Gregory. And I also want to thank uh, Jennifer Bond, uh, yourself, the uh, Open Society Foundation's uh, International Migration Initiative, and uh, Matthew Swift, uh, the CEO of uh, Concordia, for their invitation for me to be here today. I think today's discussion is really important. Uh, how do we help refugees and other newcomers to not only settle in our societies, but uh, integrate and, and succeed? And how can governments and the business community work together uh, to support this process, this really important process that, uh, that revitalizes our communities and our economies? And I fully believe that newcomers uh, can help us to build a, a better and more prosperous society. Here's just one example. I was sitting in my constituency office uh, in Toronto, in my electoral district, and I, I got, you know, I had back-to-back -back meetings from uh, the residents of that area, and uh, the, the final meeting I had was with, with, with a little bit more than a dozen people from the Vietnamese Canadian community, and um, I didn't know what they were going to ask me, uh, what to ask of me. And uh, after the initial introductions, they said, we just came for one reason, we just have one request. And I was a little nervous because I thought maybe they want a new community center or they want some funding request or something like that. But no, the, the fact is they said, we just came for you to help us uh, to figure out how to sponsor uh, new refugees. They were the um, Vietnamese boat people and their descendants who had succeeded in Canada and wanted to pay it forward. And they were talking to someone who also came to Canada and received uh, help in terms of settlement and integration and uh, who was now an elected member of parliament and, and a minister in charge of refugees. So I, I couldn't think of a better Canadian moment than that. And I, I really thought after they left, uh, could that scenario have happened in, in any other country? And I, that's not to suggest that uh, Canadians are more generous than other people. It just means that we have the framework for, for Canadians to to channel that generosity towards uh, refugees. And, and in this case, I'm talking about the Canadian uh, private sponsorship uh, of refugee model. The program, uh, which essentially started from uh, the mid to late 1970s um, as a result of the Canadian response to the Vietnamese boat people. And as a result of that program, which allows Canadians, ordinary Canadians, five people or organizations to sponsor uh, ref a refugee or refugee family, Canada has been able to, to, to provide resettlement to almost 300 more refugees than if we had just relied on the government-sponsored refugee program. And so while we uh, know that uh, we have to do the processing and the investment in settlement and, 
and other services and employment support when refugees get there. That program, the uh, Canadian Private Sponsorship of Refugee Program, has enabled Canada to, uh, to allow its citizens to channel that generosity towards uh, sp a refugee sponsorship. And, and recognizing the potential of this program, uh, my predecessor announced uh, a related Canadian initiative at this very event two years ago, the Global uh, Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, uh, which is the combination and a partnership between the Government of Canada, UNHCR, the Open Society Foundations, the Radcliffe Foundation, and the University of Ottawa. And through that, its, its aim is not to to have to cut and paste the Canadian model to other countries, but to share those experiences and to develop new community-based refugee sponsorship models across the world uh, while learning from the Canadian model. And I'm happy to report that uh, uh, a number of countries have not only approached the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, but have actually embarked on new community uh, sponsorship models. And in July of this year, I, I co-signed a statement in support of community sponsorship with ministers from UK, Spain, Argentina, uh, Ireland, and New Zealand. So why does community sponsorship of refugees work? It works because it mobilizes the entire community in the welcoming of refugees, not just those who are legally um, responsible for that welcome, who have signed that agreement. But we tend to notice that their neighbors, their friends, and, and the entire community becomes involved. So what that does is it doesn't just transform the integration outcomes and the settlement outcomes for the refugee or the refugee family. It tends to transform the sponsors themselves. And after going through that experience, they tend to become the biggest advocates for refugees and for diversity and inclusion. And in fact, um, uh, you know, um, the video that was uh, produced by, by Greasy uh, showed, uh, they, they contrasted the uh, experiences of uh, refugee sponsors in Eastern Canada with the experiences of a new crop of sponsors in, in the UK, specifically in Wales. And, uh, you know, you had grandmothers on both sides of the Atlantic talking about how they suddenly had new grandchildren that they didn't think they would ever have in their lives. So these were not just people that they sponsored. These were essentially new family members. And I can tell you after watching the video, apart from the accent, the emotions were exactly the same. Um, the private sector has a, a big role to play in this. Uh, the private sector enables uh, newcomers to have that f first job. Employers um, work through immigrant employment councils in Canada. To, uh, to motivate and equip uh, new businesses to hire newcomers and give them a chance. And this includes refugees. And the local immigration partnerships uh, all across Canada bring together employers, the local boards of trade, the municipality, the settlement organizations to continue to have this dialogue of how we can uh, have a, a better integration outcome. I just want at this moment, uh, before I conclude, to recognize to uh, exceptional Canadians who embody the generosity of Canadians. And in fact, my predecessor, uh, the Honorable John McCallum, said that uh, the Canadian immigration minister is the only minister in the world who cannot bring enough refugees to meet the demand uh, of Canadians. And so I just want to highlight two people. Jim Steele, who's here, um, President and CEO of Danby Appliances. This past March, I, I was delighted and we were honored to award you and your company with our uh, 2018 Employer Awards. Uh, we were recognizing your company's training program called Ease into Canada, which provides information on language training and business support skills for newcomers. Uh, the second person I want to recognize is Li Luong. And uh, you arrived uh, as one of the tens of thousands of Vietnamese boat people to Canada nearly many, many decades ago. And uh, you were just six years old at the time, so I want to make that clear. <laughs> you uh, went on to a successful career in education administration in the private school industry. You are the proud founder of the Global Organization of Academic Liaison and Student Services, uh, GOALS. And in 2015, you decided to pay it back. You decided to pay it forward, I should say. You got, you got involved in Canada's 
uh, whole of society approach to resettle thousands and thousands of Syrian refugees by choosing to become a private refugee sponsor. So both of these Canadians demonstrate what investing in newcomers can do both for communities and for businesses. So I always say that uh, the government of Canada could not do what it's able to do in terms of um, not just refugee sponsorship, but general welcoming of over 310,000 uh, permanent residents every year if it wasn't for a whole of society approach. So settlement and integration in Canada is not uh, the exclusive job of the government of Canada. It's a partnership with employers, with local communities, with, with over 500 settlement and integration organizations across the country and municipalities and the private sector. So we are continuing to uh, believe that our efforts uh, advance the goals of both the Global Compact on Refugees as well as the Global Compact on uh, safe, orderly, and regular migration. We are engaged in the process to develop these new compacts. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, resettlement isn't the only uh, answer, but uh, in terms of burden sharing, we should find ways to increase uh, resettlement spaces, and the Canadian private sponsorship model is one of the ways to increase uh, resettlement spaces around the world, including in Canada, but beyond. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Minister. And we'll hear more about uh, the sponsorship model in, in a few minutes when I introduce uh, Jennifer. I wanted to first, though, turn the floor over to Tim Dixon. Tim um, is a leader of the More in Common um, initiative, which tries to really understand where public attitudes are when it comes to migrants and refugees, and I think has a mission which is even more important than that, which is to try to identify the ways in which uh, we can all uh, live together better. Um, and he has, um, I think, uh, shared with you uh, on your seats and around the table a series of slides, which uh, you'll speak to, Tim. Um, and uh, over to you. Thanks. So um, I, to make things quicker, I've, we've got copies and you can sort of dig into some of the detail there. Um, but in short, in this conversation, um, I think it's really valuable to talk about public attitudes uh, because obviously the context we're working in and the sort of the, the, the dramatic change in the environment that we've gone through in the last few years, the rise of us versus then populism is resulting in, in terrible policy outcomes. Um, and that, those trends that are driving that are going to continue. I've got three things that I want to say, uh, and I can say them in 30 seconds and then unpack them a little bit. The first is across the Western world, extraordinary political convergence in the forces that are driving our politics, I think more than at any time in the post-war era. Um, and that convergence is around this polarization, around a sort of us versus them populism. It takes different forms, different places, but the people who are the casualties first when that kind of populism arises is the newcomers. It's the outsiders, uh, refugees and, and, and immigrants. However, the good news is that, and this is where we've done a ton of research in European countries and now a big study we're releasing next week um, for the United States, um, that a lot of people, in fact, the majority, we found in every country, the majority's in the middle. They don't identify with the two polarised sides, but in a social media age, you kind of only hear from those two sides. Um, but there are lots of people in the middle. And the third thing is there are ways that we can speak to the people in the middle um, that can really build strong majorities for humanitarian policies and for moving forward. Uh, not easy, it requires credible messengers, and that's where this conversation is really important because in an age where uh, professional advocates and politicians don't carry the kind of weight and authority that they did once. Uh, business is really important because business has brands, ways to reach people. It's not seen as something more of a neutral player in an environment of polarisation. So those are the three things that I think are the, the, the key takeouts. Let me just dive into the, those um, in, in terms of the, the slides we've got here. First is we've done this, this segmentation of what's driving public attitudes on, uh, relating to newcomers, but also sort of on a wide range of issues. Um, in the United States, you see the, um, the bottom left there. Uh, this is the study we're releasing next week. We find the seven tribes, um, the hidden tribes of America, we're calling them, um, two of which are sort of on the left, sort of more, more liberal, two of which are on the right, conservative, but three groups which are uh, in the middle, passive liberal group, 
don't engage much, tend to be of a liberal disposition. A disengaged group, 26%, the biggest group in the United States, um, and a moderate group, which is the, the sort of traditional sort of swing voter uh, sort of person. Uh, but a major majority of it's in the middle, despite the extraordinary polarisation of the United States. A lot of those people are just dropping out because they, the, the, the big thing that we're getting in talking to Americans is just they're just fed up and fatigued with the, with the, the, the animosity and polarisation in public debate. In, the, in, uh, in Europe, it's more of a story of a, an open and closed spectrum, um, a hardcore nationalist sort of closed mind versus a more open cosmopolitan group at the other end, a little different to the sort of more binary polarisation in the United States, but again, a majority in the middle. Each country is a little different. And we've done studies in France, Germany, the Netherlands and Italy. And if anybody's interested, I've got copies of those, those uh, reports that we've released. The key thing in the polarisation in the context of the United States, which I think is really important for the way in which we engage refugees and, and, and the immigration issues, um, is if you look at the bottom right-hand corner on the first page there, you could think that the country here is split 50-50, and this is a range of different issues, immigration, uh, feminism, racial social justice, etc. cetera. Um, but if you turn the page, look at the pattern across all these different issues, two things to draw out. One is the pattern is exactly the same. People think as tribes now. So people are not really making independent decisions on the issue of immigration or refugees, feminism, etc. They're, they're essentially, especially on the polar polarities, they're thinking the way their tribe does. And even in the middle groups who are less tribal, they follow a very clear pattern. So what's driving this? People are not rationally thinking through these issues. They're acting more emotionally. And this is where our research has, where we've brought a lot of academics into our work to understand the power of underlying psychological drivers. People's view of Jonathan Haidt's work on moral foundations, for example, um, insights on parenting style and disposition towards authoritarianism. Uh, I've got an example here um, on the third page of a question about whether you believe your life circumstances are the result of luck um, or, the, or your sort of hard work and effort. And if you're a, a progressive or a liberal, more than, I think the number is 86%, say your circumstances in life are the result of essentially what you were born into. Very pessimistic view. Very different from a conservative view which says it's your own hard work and effort. Interestingly, if you ask the progressives personally, why are you where you are, they'll say, oh, well, it was my hard work and effort, but that's not true for everyone else. Why is that important? Because refugee sponsorship is an example of something that speaks to those more middle and conservative values of hard work, effort, people integrating into the community, becoming part of the society, not just being recipients of welfare. And you consciously need to counter some of those uh, misunderstandings. And, and that's where these insights from this research are quite, quite useful. Last thing just to highlight is we've asked questions about people's perception of refugee sponsorship in a number of our surveys because inspired by the, 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 the Canadian experience and the Canadian policy, we think that's an example of a policy that really has a way through of bringing people together and countering misconceptions and reaching the values of people um, in, in middle groups. And we find, interestingly, even in countries that are quite hostile to immigration, um, like France, one in five people say they'd like to take part in a refugee sponsorship program. Um, and it engages faith communities, which is a really valuable community to, to, to engage. So there is a way forward. Why the business community is so important is because in an environment where there are very few neutral actors to carry hopeful messages that bring people together, business is one that can do that. I think that's part of a the conversation today is the value of brands, the value of convening um, different actors, bring them together around a more positive agenda. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. So when we started the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, we were motivated by three things. One was that we saw in 2015 this outpouring of desire by people to help refugees, and they weren't able to really plug in. And what Minister Hussein said, allows, uh, the, the sponsorship system allows for that infrastructure for people to plug in with their compassion to be built. You mentioned 500 organizations in Canada. People can call up a local organization and say, we want to be part of something. The second reason was because of exactly what Tim said, which is that if we are going to build societies that find strength in the diversity, people are going to have to interact. And these sponsorship efforts allow in some cases, literally hundreds of individuals and local community groups 
to welcome a single family. Sometimes it's five, sometimes it's 20, 100, 150. That is a tremendous uh, amount of interaction that hasn't always, uh, that wouldn't otherwise take place. In fact, when we started the initiative, we talked about the uh, refugee sponsorship model as addressing two crises of our times. One is the displacement crisis, and the other is the loneliness crisis. Because when you speak in Canada and you talk with these groups, they talk about themselves. They talk about how much sponsorship has changed their own lives, bringing them in touch with, with their neighbors. So that was the second reason. The third reason was because we saw that when it came to immigration, when it comes to uh, refugee support, that the leadership wasn't gonna come from our national politicians for the most part. That we needed to create platforms and con build constituencies, build a movement from the ground up. And that's why individuals uh, matter enormously. That's why local government matters enormously. And that's why the private sector matters. Obviously the private sector is employing you know, the vast majority of newcomers in our societies. Um, so we had that vision, we shared that vision with the UNHCR, we shared it with the Government of Canada, um, but there was no way we could have actually pulled that vision together without Jennifer Bond, who leads the refugee hub at the University of Ottawa. She also leads the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative. Um, and just to embarrass you just a little bit, the talent that it takes, the ability that it takes to really understand these different languages, the languages of government, the language of international organizations, which is different than that of governments, the language of local government, which is different still, let alone how civil society thinks and acts, how the private sector thinks and acts, to try to find that common ground, to try to create a consensus around it, to get everyone to be speaking the same language, is really incredibly difficult work, and we are thrilled to have uh, Jennifer in the lead on that, and I will also pass over leadership of this session to her now. Thanks, Jennifer. Great, thank you very much. You did succeed in embarrassing me, Gregory. Thanks for that. Um, good morning, everyone, and what a real privilege it is to be here back at Concordia exactly two years from the moment when uh, three incredibly important and different organizations came together to form the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative. So it's a, a real delight to mark this two-year anniversary together with my co-panelists, um, and thank you so much for being here. Um, you've already heard from Minister Houston, Gregory, and uh, Tim a little bit about what motivates the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative's work. Um, I will warn you right now that the partners agree on many, many things. We do not agree on how to pronounce our acronyms. So you might hear Greasy, GRSI, or Jersey all mentioned today. <laughs> We've agreed to disagree on this point. Um, but I, I will say that this work would not be possible without a huge number of additional additional partners all around the world who really are helping us realize a vision of sponsorship in their own local communities, taking into account the very real differences both in the political sector but also very much on, on the ground in the grassroots communities who are doing this welcoming. Um, so it's an equal thrill for me to see some of those partners from around the world with us today at this table. And I'm going to keep my comments extremely brief because really um, what a privilege to be able to hear from all of them and, and uh, weave together some of their experiences with sponsorship. Um, you've already heard a little bit about our partnership and, and some of the momentum that uh, we're seeing around the concept of community welcoming globally. I just will add one additional um, piece of information from our side before turning it over to our panel. Um, and the f that is what do we mean when we say sponsorship? Um, and I think it's a term that is used a lot and actually it's kind of hard to define. And so I will come back at the close of session um, and see what our, our panelists might think um, sponsorship actually is at its core. What is it? What are its defining attributes? Um, but just to kickstart some thinking around that, I think that in the partnership, in the GRSI partnership, we really see that sponsorship at its core is about very deep empowerment of individual citizens. It's about trusting people in our communities to do the hard work of welcoming and integrating newcomers, not as someone who's outside of them, who's sort of cheering for from the sidelines, but as a partner. So you're invested in their success because their success as newcomers is also your success as a sponsor. And that makes it different from other forms of volunteering or other forms of support um, for, for newcomers, refugees, or, or others. Um, so that's how we're defining 
understanding it, but we really um, are evolving our definition and our understanding as this work continues. And I'll look forward to hearing from some of the, the rest of those of you around this table um, of how you see sponsorship and how your understanding of that concept may also have be evolving. Um, I'd like to kick off our session by turning to um, Kelly Clements, who is the uh, Deputy High Commissioner for UNHCR, and as you've heard, a partner in the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative. And Kelly, I'd like to ask you, at this time of enormous challenge around refugee protection globally, why is the UNHCR as an institution in this partnership, and why are you pursuing sponsorship as part of your broader agenda? Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thanks, Gregory, and it's such a pleasure to be next to the minister who's been a champion of protection and, and uh, uh, refugee resettlement, as well as this important initiative for, for the time of his tenure, and I suspect even before. Um, I'm also pleased to be with, with this uh, distinguished group around the table for this conversation. Uh, you mentioned, and in fact, the minister in his comments talked about the Global Compact on Refugees, and as we're sitting here having this conversation over in the UN building, uh, my boss, the High Commissioner, uh, is having a high-level discussion about, about the compact on refugees and about the um, drive to bring it home uh, in the next few weeks in terms of seeing its adoption along with the global compact on, on migrants. I think it's, it's exceedingly important. Jennifer, you mentioned how um, this is an important moment in time. Uh, 68.5 million forcibly displaced. Uh, we have exceedingly uh, seen protection principles challenged, uh, government policies that don't necessarily reflect um, good protection in terms of people who are seeking uh, asylum and uh, international protection. And now we have, um, obviously, this important mechanism uh, which has a real opportunity to bring more people into, uh, to be advocates of protection and advocates of bringing people in their communities where they want to start new lives. This is not about refugees being uh, dependent on international services, on communities, on governments, on international organizations like the one that I represent. Um, it's about the ability to provide uh, a, a place for families to rebuild, for families to find places to put their ch kids in school, uh, seek health services, and for their parents to seek employment and to be able to rebuild their own lives and to be empowered to do so as opposed to being dependent on the international system. So for us, this uh, initiative in particular, it's a new approach to expand resettlement. Some have said it's, it, it's a, a competition of, uh, far from it from our perspective. It's a complementary way in terms of really building the, the public-private uh, partnership when it comes to uh, refugee protection and, and refugees starting new lives. There are, I would say, Jennifer, three important um, protection policy objectives, and the minister and Gregory both mentioned uh, uh, a few of them in their opening remarks and in the keynote that the minister provided in terms of why the the, the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative is important. And the first is, and this is the fundamental um, piece of the Global Compact on Refugees, it's about responsibility sharing. Uh, it's about how do we expand the, the, the network where we can bring uh, people into communities that both can provide and help to build and enrich a community, but also are extremely vulnerable in the places in which they have found asylum and have found protection for a period of time. Uh, so that is in, important to us. On the resettlement front, the numbers aren't good. From our perspective, from, from the UN Refugee Agency, we have identified 1.4 million people in need of international protection through resettlement. In 2018, only 80,000 will find that form of protection. So the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative is one more way to extend that form of protection. It's, it's an advocate and it's an important mechanism for a solution to an individual family's peril uh, in terms of this particular issue. The second important uh, protection policy uh, objective, Jennifer, that it, it, it um, reinforces, and the minister talked at length about this, is the support that it provides for new and emerging resettlement countries. And, and he mentioned, uh, I think, the six that are, are core members, and I understand from Gregory there are several more in the wings who will, who will be part of that. 
From um, UNHCR's perspective, in the last couple of years since this initiative was launched, we've now seen an expansion in the number of countries that want to join the family of resettlement nations. We now have 35. In the, in the old days, there used to be a few big ones, and now we have an expansion, which actually we see as a very important uh, objective. We need more countries to join together in terms of seeing this as a responsibility that they want to share. You all know that about 85% of, of the world's forcibly displaced are in the developing world. This is one of those ways where countries can step forward and provide homes uh, to those in need. The, the, um, in terms of the, the emerging uh, resettlement nations, the private sector, of course, uh, has an important piece of that. And that's what's important in terms of, the, of, of this particular initiative, because it's not just a home and a school, but it's also employment. Business have solutions, but they also have opportunities uh, for livelihoods and the like. So some of, and some of the partners around the table have been very important partners in this. But the, 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 um, the offers that they have put forward to link up business with newcomers could not be more valuable, and many more are stepping to the table. The third point, and then I'll, I'll stop to, to keep this conversation going, is the, and this was mentioned as well as in the opening remarks, the third policy objective is increasing public support. Uh, for refugees, uh, for migrants. The social cohesion aspects, and this comes through so, so uh, well in, in Tim Dixon's work, uh, is extraordinarily important. It's not just a matter of putting a family in a place and having that family sustain themselves, but to have a community around them and a network around them. It, it performs an important advocacy perspective. It builds support for refugee protection. The unknown becomes the known, which builds support. And this can't be overemphasized. When you have communities that are supportive of initiatives like this one, they put pressure on local authorities, they put pressure on governments, governments then step forward and do the right thing. So from the UNHCR perspective, thank you so much for bringing attention to this, keeping it going for two years, and we're delighted to be part of this initiative. Great, thank you very much. Um, Jim, I'd like to turn to you. You've heard um, both of my colleagues talk about the importance of private sector engagement, whole of society approach, <clears throat> diversification of actors. Um, you're a very successful business person who is also probably Canada's largest sponsor. You've done a tremendous um, number of sponsorships in the last few years. What assets do you think the private sector in particular brings to refugee resettlement? Well, the main thing a private settlement can do is um, have people that care about the people they're bringing in. Governments can write a check, but you can't hire friends. Um, I also think from a, um, uh, acceptance of refugees, it's people accept refugees, they say, wow, this person's hardworking, this person's contributing to our society. Um, where people become resentful, if they say, this person came in and they're collecting our welfare and they're just living off the rest of the taxpayers. Um, and that's where the UNHCR has, uh, I mean, I know you, ha you want, you have, I'm a humanitarian, you have very needy people, but when you send in someone that is illiterate in a wheelchair, it's a lot tougher to say they're going to support themselves and it builds a resentment because people say, that's my taxpayer's money. Uh, I also am uh, very much a believer that businesses know how to organize things efficiently and can pivot and do things quickly. And um, I just think th it's incumbent on business people to do it because I always say to my friends, I have about 800 volunteers, and I say to my friends, if you can have a business with 800 employees, you can have, a, uh, you can have 800 volunteers. It's the same thing. And the problem you have with the church groups, which I love, is they're not used to dealing with scalable organization. They're, they're saying, oh, it's, you know, we're going to have a bake sale to raise $1,000. Great, thank you. So I think um, that emphasis on scale and, and private sector resourcing is one that we've actually heard quite a few places around the world. And, and I think a lot of people are looking to your leadership, Jim. How could this work inside, um, inside businesses? And what role could businesses play? So, so thank you very much. And I look forward to coming back to you for a few more specifics. Um, I'd like to bring uh, Charlotte Phillips now uh, into the conversation. She leads the sponsorship portfolio for Amnesty International, so quite a different actor from the private sector, but equally passionate about this work and engaging um, around the world, trying to promote the concept of sponsorship. So Charlotte, I'd like to ask you a similar question. Um, why is Amnesty engaging in this work, and what assets do you think you bring to the table in terms of sponsorship? 
Hi, thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so Amnesty International has been engaging with community sponsorship for about two years now. Um, we had been working on resettlement, and, and as has been mentioned today, it, it's a very tough um, environment to grow resettlement at the moment. We know it's at a 10-year low at the moment. So we really needed to look for new and innovative ways uh, to move people from A to B, to get refugees to safety, but also to work with a wider range of stakeholders, not just governments. Um, and so from our perspective, community sponsorship really ticked all the boxes. So for example, when working with governments, it allowed us to be really propositional. So we could bring a solution to the table um, rather than just criticize the government for its policies, but actually bring something positive and say, here's a model that you can try. And there's a proven track record. We've seen it succeed in Canada. And that is hu hugely useful for our advocacy. Um, secondly, it, it basically took us back to our, our roots. Um, because we're asking ordinary, and quote marks, because obviously people are extraordinary, but ordinary people um, to take injustice personally and then take personal responsibility um, for helping to change the world, essentially. So it's really powerful in that way. Um, we have seven million supporters around the world, all willing, not even willing, desperate to do something positive in the, in the refugee space. Um, and here we've got a will, um, and now we can give them away. I mean, the main criticism that we had when we started this work from our supporters was, why hasn't Amnesty done this before? Like, why, why are we only just starting to do this? So one of the benefits, I think, for an organization like Amnesty is we have the activists. Now we've got something that, that tangible that they can do. Great, thank you. Um, Kelly, can I turn back to you? Um, you have called, I think, both in the GCR and again this morning for new entrants, you know, more partnerships, different types of actors engaging in this space. Um, you've heard from a business leader. You've heard from Amnesty International. You know there's um, a wide range of others around the world um, engaging through sponsorship. What kind of risks um, do you see, or do you see any risks, in terms of expanding the, the range of people who are engaging in refugee resettlement work? It's a good question. I think there, it, you, one needs to look at why there is engagement and what the objectives are. I think what you're seeing now is we have very similar interests, although we have different objectives from where we come. Uh, a business's interest is not necessarily international protection of refugees. However, they see it in their interest, you know, in terms of bringing back to a community the economic vitality and so on. They see that partnership. Um, I think the 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 piece in terms of, and I mentioned this, I alluded to this in the opening, where we, I think we can make, uh, Jim, to your question, the, the vulnerable cohabitate and consistent with the producers. And in many places, when we're, trying, when we're looking at refugee resettlement, um, we do put extremely vulnerable people in with economic breadwinners. So somehow being able to tell the story and have businesses be able to help to tell the story as well. You see this in communities in Canada, you see this in communities in the US, in, in parts of Europe and the like. So it's one, I think, depending upon the audience and depending upon the perspective of that, that engagement, it, you can achieve the objectives of the particular participant in the, the initiative and be able to have a win-win. You're, protect, you're protecting people, you're seeing economic uh, vitality, community engagement, support and advocacy, and then broader arrangement in terms of the international protection objectives. Great, thank you. And I, I think it is true, it's a, it's a helpful reflection on the fact that sometimes what motivates sponsorships and, and engagement in resettlement is very different for different actors, um, but they can come together where those interests um, overlap in a, in a really helpful way. So, so thank you for that. I'd like to turn now to Lisa Button and Russ Rook, um, who are here respectively from Australia and the UK. So thank you both so much for joining us from a distance. You're on opposite sides of me here. Um, both of you are engaged in encouraging the development of sponsorship programs in your respective countries. They're in different places, so I'm hoping both of you can and open your remarks with a very brief snapshot of what's happening in the UK, what's happening in the Australia on the sponsorship file. Um, but then if you could really explain in your own understanding of what's happening, why the idea of sponsorship is making people excited in your respective countries. So Russ, I'll start with you. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning. Well, yes, in the United Kingdom, we launched um, sponsorship in uh, in 2016. Our first sponsor was the Archbishop of Canterbury, who welcomed a family to live in his uh, palace. In uh, uh, We haven't been able to repeat that very often, but um, it was a good start, and uh, it made a statement. And in the first 18 months of a trial program, uh, we sponsored 18 families into the UK. We now have about 140 groups looking to sponsor in the next year, and so it's starting to grow quite fast. In, in, in answer to the question of, uh, of why, why we're doing it, I think, I think it's simply, it, it is an opportunity of a lifetime. It's an opportunity of a lifetime, obviously, for the refugees. It saves lives. Sponsorship saves lives, full stop. It's an opportunity of the lifetime for our communities. In a world which has grown worn and weary and suffers compassion fatigue, this opportunity to look at a global crisis and say, actually, we can actually find a local solution is phenomenal. It is a truly global project. It allows groups to try and respond to something that is big and beyond them in a way which is tangible and makes a difference in their community. And I think the other, the other thing I would say, it's an opportunity of a lifetime uh, for the global community and in terms of policy. I mean, we, we've heard the statistics in a world where there's 22.5 million refugees, where the average refugee is spending 18 years in a refugee camp, where, uh, as, as um, Kelly said earlier, we are uh, resettling less than 6% of the most vulnerable and, and less than 1% of the entire sum of refugees in the world. We have to do everything we possibly can to increase the capacity of our communities to welcome refugees and where the local narrative and debate is toxic we have to do everything we can to change it and transform it into something more positive and we believe that refugee sponsorship does all of that and so at a time when this uh, refugee crisis will define our era we believe on all kinds of levels that community sponsorship is truly the opportunity of a lifetime. Thanks, um, Jennifer and Russell. Um, so Australia represents a little bit of a paradox in this area, and I think it's the paradox that drives the interest and excitement in community sponsorship at the moment. Um, unlike the UK, for example, um, Australia has been resettling large numbers of refugees for quite a few decades, um, you know, a very good global citizen in that regard. But on the other hand, in recent uh, years, our approach to asylum um, has become incredibly regressive. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about offshore processing and how people who seek asylum by boat are sent to small island nations in, uh, in neighbouring countries. And, uh, and some of them have been sort of warehoused there for, for five years now. Um, so there's a lot of uh, compassion in the Australian community and a lot of built up anger around those um, policies, um, along with just a baseline a level of interest in, in helping refugees generally. Um, and that's driving uh, an interest in, in programs that, that allow Australians to express generosity towards refugees through community sponsorship. And it's something uh, that in a really uh, difficult political climate is one of the, the areas where we think there might be um, some political cut through. Um, there is a program for uh, private sponsorship in Australia that was introduced around a year ago. Um, but it's not getting the sort of community buy-in that would allow it to sort of deliver the dividends that it does in Canada. Um, it's not additional to government resettlement efforts. So a lot of community organisations who might otherwise be sponsors think, well, you know, why should we put our hands up when the government's going to do this anyway if we don't pay for it, the, the, the public purse will. Um, it's incredibly expensive with government visa charges on top of the, the financial support that uh, sponsors um, would be on the hook for. And it also introduces a lot of restrictive criteria around things like English language and um, employability on arrival and so forth that, that exclude the most, um, those most in need of resettlement. So a number of um, humanitarian, human rights um, and refugee advocacy organisations have banded together. I, I represented Save the Children Australia, but now um, uh, we formed the Community Refugee Sponsorship Initiative with Amnesty International National uh, Refugee Council, um, faith groups, rural Australian groups uh, to argue and advocate uh, for a bigger and better um, community.
community sponsorship program in Australia, more in line with the Canadian experience. Great, thank you. Um, I will say that our approach as the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative, I'm saying the long version so I can avoid the controversy over the acronym, <laughs> um, that uh, our approach has really been to recognize that each country has to design its own model. So you know, what will work in Canada will not work in the UK, it will not work in Australia, will not work in other places. And, and you know, we've really seen our role as trying to catalyze connections, try to bring people together, offer examples of what's happening in other places, but really to encourage the, the local actors, governments and communities to work together in the policy design process to come up with a model fit for each individual context. And we learn something in each of these conversations um, which helps inform what we can say as we're engaging in this accompaniment of other places. And the Australia example is really interesting um, because I think we're trying to understand why the community hasn't become really animated by the opportunities to sponsorship which are available to it under the current program. And Lisa and her colleagues have really been trying to encourage a, a, some modifications to that program that they think would animate community. And, and what we find really interesting is the number of people engaged um, through her leadership and the leadership of her colleagues in the advocacy effort around sponsorship is extraordinary. And in incredibly diverse, football clubs, faith-based groups, rural communities, celebrities, local organizations, all working together, actually modeling what sponsorship is about, pushing for some reforms to the policy structure. So it's an interesting case study for us in terms of what works from a policy design and how critical it is to get some aspects of policy design right to make sure you don't lose the magic of whatever it is that makes sponsorship really work. Um, and with that, I would now like to turn to Lee. Um, thank you so much for being here. We've heard some kind words of introduction from our minister explaining, Lee, that you uh, probably more than anyone understand the magic of sponsorship. You were, of course, yourself sponsored um, when you were a small child, um, came to Canada, um, and have now, as a very successful Canadian, chosen to become a sponsor yourself. Um, so I'd like you, with the benefit of those two perspectives, to maybe offer um, your perspectives on what makes this program work. What is it about sponsorship that's so unique and so special? Thank you very much, um, my distinguished panelists, uh, for this opportunity to share my experience. Um, as a private uh, refugee myself, imagine at the age of three, you're standing in line for food and water. This is a very striking image that carries with you to this day. So when you are helping um, a refugee child, you're able to understand and be compassionate about the needs of those individuals. From the perspective of um, a sponsorship, there's lots that we can do to help, um, not only from the local communities. There's been a lot of positive feedback um, in the com Canadian communities um, right back in the 19 late 70s when I was first sponsored. Um, you know, community face uh, community. Faith uh, group um, helped sponsored my family. And then now um, there are lots of organizations, churches, soccer clubs, as you had mentioned, and even um, private businesses that are getting together. And how we're benefiting um, from the sponsorship groups is adding to the cultural diversity you know, of the Canadian fabric. Um, these individuals are contributing back to societies. Um, with these refugees that I'm working with, some of them have, uh, they've been in Canada for the last few years and they are helping um, my group, helping to sponsor other Syrian refugees. So it's not about myself paying it forward, but it's also about these refugees who've recently um, arrived within a year or two, they're also giving back because they recognize what a struggle it was to live as refugees and the resettlement process here in Canada. Great, thank you very much. Um, it is quite extraordinary to imagine you as a three-year-old um, in that lineup and to see you here today. So thank you very much for sharing your, for, for sharing your journey with us. 
Um, I'd like to turn now to Charlotte in a slightly different capacity, because in addition to leading um, Amnesty's global work in this space, Charlotte has also um, started a sponsorship group in the workplace, um, leveraging the work site and her colleagues of Amnesty International to form a community sponsorship group, which is um, recently applied to sponsors through the UK program. Um, so Charlotte, I'd love to hear from you as a, a um, almost sponsor about what has motivated you to take that up um, and take that on in the workplace. And then I'd like to come to you, Jim, who, as, I, as I've mentioned, has really spearheaded this idea of the workplace sponsorship. Um, and if you have any advice to give Charlotte and her colleagues as they're thinking about becoming a workplace um, sponsorship group, uh, we'd love to hear it. But first, uh, Charlotte, over to you about why you're engaging in this aspect of your work. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so basically what happened was, as an organization, Amnesty had made a decision to prioritize community sponsorship as part of its uh, refugee work. Um, and our headquarters are based in London. So we realized, um, myself and other colleagues on the refugee team, that if we wanted to, we could be doing the sponsorship ourselves. Um, and it seemed to make a lot of sense. So we were asked, already trying to learn as much as we could about sponsorship, and here was an opportunity to actually you know, experience it. Um, you know, Amnesty is very good at talking the talk, but this was really about walking the walk for us. Um, so we started a, a staff sponsorship group. I, I understand it was the first um, business um, in the UK to start such a group. Um, and it has been a phenomenally interesting and positive experience. I mean, I think it's a given, but you know, the, the staff members who are in the sponsorship group um, have found it hugely rewarding. Uh, the family that we're sponsoring hasn't arrived yet. They're, they're arriving in November, actually. Um, but still, the experience of planning it, of, of, of pulling the money together, et cetera, has been hugely positive. And working with people from different departments across the office who you wouldn't otherwise necessarily be working with, you know, is, is really rewarding. But I think um, what's also interesting, and I think other people have touched upon it, is how it brings the wider community together. So it's not just about the people in the sponsorship group. Uh, because we're in an office environment and we're an office-based community, you know, we've done a lot of our fundraising via our colleagues. So you know, organizing lunches and bake sales. We've, a, lot of, a lot of cake has been consumed um, in order to make this happen. Um, but you know, uh, other people who are not in the sponsorship group have donated money, they've donated time, they've donated baked goods. Um, and so I think it, it, it's interesting because when the family does arrive in November, I think actually that the whole office will feel like they contributed towards that. And I think, you know, that's a really special in an office environment. And, and it's not something that I've experienced before. So I really think that the benefits sort of ripple out and, and the positivity and, and the conversations um, kind of affect everybody in that space. Great. Thank you. Jim, any reflections and, and advice for Charlotte? So what, what Charlotte says is right on as far as drawing a workplace together. When a community, when a, a workplace sponsors someone, and I've carbon copied you on some emails I've sent to my business friends, I say, do you want a free team building exercise? Pull your team together. And then you get the business behind it because there are some things that the business needs to um, allow people to have some time off because not all the meetings can, or appointments can be done uh, except during work hours. But it draws the business together Another reason it's important for business is less than 20% of the population attend organized religion. 80% that, that where the, but the, everyone else works. So everyone works, you may as well tap into 100% instead of just tapping into the 20%. I've also found it's a great leadership training because it's not necessarily the same org chart. So one of the, the groups that I'm working with, it's not the CEO of the company that's, that's leading it, it's being led by um, a low-level staffer, and uh, that's excellent leadership um, training. Great, thank you. Um, I will 
be closing this session shortly because we are a little bit behind and we need to get back on track um, to hear from the other panelists here on some really exciting and related initiatives, I have to say. Um, but I just wanted to quickly, before um, before turning it over to Kelly for some final reflections, um, I just wanted to, to say that in Canada and in the UK, sponsorship groups can take any form. So we're hearing about workplace sponsorships. They can be book clubs. They can be faith-based. They can be neighborhoods. They can be entire rural communities. And I think that diversity is extremely exciting. Um, but the workplace, for the reasons you've just articulated, Jim, to me, there's there's something really special about the idea of seeing the community around our workplaces. And as Gregory mentioned, the dual benefits of not only engaging in this humanitarian act, but bringing the workplace together in interesting ways. So thank you for that. Um, Kelly, I'd like to close with you just um, some reflections about the broader benefits of sponsorship. And I think you touched on those um, when you began in terms of bringing communities together. As you reflect on, on what you've heard today, um, where do you see us heading in terms of, of the, um, the benefits that we should be promoting as we think about sponsorship and really encouraging these models around the world? Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks for the discussion. It is, it's, it, it is very interesting because it brings, of course, all of us that come from different perspectives towards a common goal. Um, and I think that in terms of some of the, it, it, if I, I go back to the global because of course we're very focused on that, but we can't lose sight of the very, the grassroots benefits of driving a, 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 an engagement of change. And I think this is where we need to take the global perspective and keep coming back to what we can do as community members, what we can do within our own uh, particular parts of that community, whether it's business or, or faith-based, or families and making connections with other people. We have found uh, on with how challenging it has been on refugee advocacy uh, in the last uh, couple of years in particular, we have found that it is the individual stories and the individual connections and trying to really tell a story of that these are not necessarily, these are individuals, these are families, these are people like Lee who come with a very particular, um, um, very particular stories of, of despair, but they are those that have rebuilt communities and been leaders and they deserve our support at a grassroots level. And each of those levels of engagement builds a constituency that in an overall perspective builds the case for international protection, for responsibility sharing, for us coming together as a global community. So it's, it's not to be underestimated and widely supported. So thanks again. Great, thank you very much. And thank you also to all of our panelists. I know we will continue this conversation outside of this circle. It's too brief, but gives you a taste of who is here with us um, over the next few days um, engaged in sponsorship. Some in the audience and some around this table, I'm sure will be keen to continue the conversation. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'd now like to turn it over to Shruti Melrata from the, um, I'm sorry, Shruti, I'm gonna take another run at it. <laughs> Shruti Mahrota um, from the, uh, she was the Director of Policy for the Soros Economic Development Fund and the OSF Economic Advancement Program. Um, and she's going to lead the portion of our conversation today focused on um, investment and corporate activism. So over to you, Shruti. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Um, and I'll, I'll refrain from getting into huge introductions. We have a huge array of interesting experience that thinks about that whole of society approach that uh, the minister was referring to, but particularly focused on the role of the private sector. And if we think about where we are uh, this week in New York, the private sector at a moment like Unga increasingly is asking itself, what more can we do? How, more can, how much more can we participate in the SDGs more broadly? We've seen a huge movement over the last 20 years on areas like sustainability and increasingly more activity in places like that. And this is an interestingly new version of that conversation that in some ways started in earnest two years ago here at Concordia, where the private sector came out in various forms and said, we have a role to play in investing in newcomers and host communities, refugees and migrants. And so we have an array of private sector actors and supportive civil society organizations that are working on this question of private sector engagement in this 
relatively nascent subject, but there are examples of real things that the private sector has been able to do that build upon some of what has already happened in this absolutely inspiring space, I find, of, uh, of private sponsorship. Um, so we have two specific segments. One is thinking about the role of core business and, and investors within core business. And then a second about the role of the private sector as voices, as advocates, so CEO activism, as, uh, as Jennifer was alluding to. So let me start off with a couple of investors who are thinking about how, with their investment capital, the private sector can participate. So the first, I'm, I'll turn to you, Sean, from the Soros Economic Development Fund. Um, and the one thing I will ask all of the speakers, since we're running a little bit late, if we could bring some um, private sector efficiency to our comments. Um, that would be much appreciated, a little bit less than the two minutes I said to each of you before. Um, but with that, over to you, Sean, to tell us about your experience. Yes, yeah, Shruti's worked with me for long enough to know that that's tough for me, so uh, I will do my very best. Um, look, I think we share with so many around the room the belief that the private sector has a crucial role to play. Um, we. Uh, we're at this uh, forum a couple of years ago when George Soros, um, uh, whose philanthropy the Open Society Foundations is and, uh, and whose funds we um, have stewardship over, uh, announced a $500 million um, commitment to uh, capital to invest in the private sector to make sure that the supply of capital wasn't the reason that the private sector was not stepping up to throw out a challenge to those in the private sector to come forward with those opportunities that would intersect with the needs of, as we defined it, refugees, migrants, and host communities um, uh, in order to, uh, to, to sort of incentivize and to create the opportunities for the private sector. I'm going to talk a little bit, if I have any time left at the end, about some of the things we've learned, but let me dive into some of the things that we've done. Um, we focused... Uh, at the high level on three areas. Um, we focused on employment, we focused on entrepreneurship, and we focused on businesses that deliver services to refugees and migrants. For employment, we know from all of the work around the world that SMEs and infrastructure are the two things that generate short, big, high-level uh, uh, employment at scale in a reasonable time. With SMEs, uh, you know, finance is constrained. With infrastructure, Perversely, around the world, finance is not constrained. Infrastructure is one of the few uh, interventions where there's more than enough uh, capital. The problem is, where do these projects get developed and how do they come? We've focused on uh, deploying funds to SMEs. Uh, I think Sam is going to uh, uh, share some news from uh, uh, on the Shell Foundation on an investment we've made into... Uh, oh, and I'm stealing his thunder, so I won't do that. But something that Sam will talk about. Um, and uh, I will now go ahead and steal uh, Frank Justra's thunder because he's not here and say that we are uh, also working with the Ascend Fund uh, on an SME uh, venture in Greece. So, you know, we've deployed uh, upwards, uh, uh, you know, a series of investments uh, in the sort of five to $10 million range, each of them, uh, which focus on providing capital at a small scale to SMEs. In terms of infrastructure, it's a more difficult problem. Infrastructure and other larger scale capital deployments. Uh, I'll now steal Jim Kim's thunder, uh, because he's also not here. Um, doesn't pay to miss these, uh, these, these events, I have to say. Um, and, and announce a collaboration with the bank and with the IFC to create a, a catalyst that will actually not so much focus on raising and assembling money, but will focus on developing these projects that can be funded. It's very easy to assume that lack of capital is the problem, and very often in our experience, it's not. You're going to do, give me the wind up? Is that, am I doing all right? Um, let me say a few. We, we, we have another um, a number of areas, including impact bonds, housing, and other things that we're now looking at uh, in order to deploy capital at scale. Let me say three things that we've learned. The first is that we have to look at this as uh, uh, the, the issue of refugees, migrants, from the private sector perspective, has to be seen as a stock and not a flow. Has to be seen as a permanent feature of the, of the landscape, of the economies in which we work. And we have to recognize that the length of time and the number of people has tipped 
from a humanitarian flow problem into a fundamental feature, a sort of a non-placed nation of, hun you know, of tens, which will become potentially hundreds of millions of people around the world. And that's something that has to be dealt with differently by the private sector. Uh, the second is that investment alone is not enough, um, that it has to be linked tightly to policy, to, to regulatory, uh, and to the role of the civil society. And we as a foundation are uh, you know, able to work with others to, to deploy for all forms of capital around this problem. Well done, Sean. Thank you. Um, with that, I'll draw you in, Sam. Um, I know that you're going to make a, an announcement around um, a new investment that you all are making, but if you could take a step back and sort of give us a sense of um, the Shell Foundation's experience in deploying capital along the same lines as, as Sean was describing in this particular new space. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks very much for having me too. Um, so the Shell Foundation builds businesses which contribute to the SDGs, because that's kind of what we do. And one of those things, uh, one of those uh, organizations that we've co-founded, I guess, about 10 years ago was a, was a company called Growfen, and they fund SMEs. And some of, the fun, some of those SMEs happen to be in countries of great uh, economic and political instability, and they happen to fund uh, um, um, Iraq, uh, Jordan, Egypt, um, Oman. There's a whole Middle East fund. So I guess the message, uh, and I think within this, in the context of this discussion, I think uh, what is the message? I'll be in, within two minutes, what is the message? Is there are models that can work and are working around helping refugees and migrants to build businesses in a sustainable way. And there are examples and cases that you can go and look at and touch and feel, which are very encouraging. And they can almost be done on a self-funded basis. So, so to set up a fund which finances SMEs in very, very tough environments, not only in countries of destination where people have migrated to, but also countries of origin where there's, the, there's a massive amount of instability, can be done. It's very tough but it can be done almost on a self-funded basis because the fund more, it doesn't get the 20, 30% IRRs that you would do in a PE fund, but it can pay for itself and get a small return. So in the case of Jordan, for example, $19 million invested over recent two or three recent, uh, three to five years, uh, 35 SMEs um, and over 440 SMEs with, with business support. And Many of those uh, are actually owned by refugees themselves, and most of them employ refugees. In the case of Jordan, mostly in the northern part of the area with the highest, uh, highest degree of, of refugee influx in the country. So over two, just in the case of Jordan, over 2,500 jobs sustained, which is a mixture of created and sustained. And I think that the message in this room, um, and we will be, of course, in the case of the Jordan Fund, um, whilst it's been going for several years, uh, we're going in with another major push, and we're very grateful and very pleased that the Soros Economic Development Fund is coming in with a significant contribution of capital and business support, which, um, I'm, am I allowed to say how much, Sean, is $8.5 eight, eight million into the, just the Jordan Fund, which is going to be phenomenally important for creating jobs. And when I talk about the work of the Shell Foundation, I, I, I always try and to uh, mention Iraq, uh, because if you go to the southern part of Iraq, uh, there's very little happening from a development perspective. And to see the growth in team in Basra going around and meeting SMEs, investing in their businesses, providing the business, and creating jobs and realizing that that is actually holding people in Basra. It's getting people to be able to find a way of making a living, moving away from some of the other activities that they get naturally drawn into in an environment which is phenomenally difficult is very inspiring we've just been we've just been uh, approached by the US government to try and expand that work into northern parts of Iraq which few people work in and really want to do anything uh, anything at all all of the paraphernalia around security is just intimidating but we're going to do it uh, and we're going to do it through through because we believe that this works uh, of refugees both in countries of destination and origin are just like you and I they're entrepreneurial they want to make better lives for themselves Private set solutions, solutions are one way, not the only way by any means, but they're one way where you can actually help um, people to establish themselves, pay for their own you know, future, if you like. So uh, I, guess a note, I guess a note of optimism uh, from my side. And thanks again to, the, uh, to, to Sean and his team for getting involved.
Excellent. Um, and Jay uh, Collins from City, you have been engaging in this subject, particularly in a series of partnerships from what we understand. Um, Linking into what Sam and Sean have said about the role of refugees um, and migrants as employees, but also as entrepreneurs, what's been your experience about from City's perspective and engaging in this subject? Sure, thank you. Well, first, I'd, I'd just agree with Sam that there are new models, and we are breaking glass with models, and they are working. And if you look at this do good, do well model, which we've embraced in tackling the SDGs as a as a journey. Um, where we're moving from the foundation thought process to core business and to the front line, to local micro ecosystems of partnerships between the public sector and, and governments, between NGOs and the humanitarian community and the private sector. That is the model of the future. That's the model we're embracing and we're, um, you know, we're, we're implementing by partnering, as, as you said. Um, I was blessed with the opportunity thanks to Carolyn, to visit a number of refugee camps over the course of the past year, IDP in Ethiopia, the Rohingya with Carolyn in, in, um, in Bangladesh and, and in Jordan with the Syrians. And, you know, the one thing I came away with, and I think it, it, it sums up where we are as a firm, is, is that when you go beyond the core of the response of the humanitarian organizations from a private sector perspective, these children sit there and, and they, they ask you for hope, and the hope is about livelihood. The hope is about what is the future. And so for, for, from a private sector perspective, that pathway to a, to a paycheck, that pathway to give work, um, is to steal a phrase, um, is absolutely fundamental. So our efforts are pointing toward that. The work that we're doing with the International Rescue Committee is a great example where we've said, you know, the rescuing futures, as we've called it to your project, is about 16 to 24 year olds and what can we do to train them to be employable? What can we do to help them with the entrepreneurial spirit and the entrepreneurial tools to make them employable? Um, another project that we're doing also with the IRC is saying let's take our best clients in 30 cities around the world and say what are the best practice about how a city absorbs refugees, um, vulnerable peoples? What, what are the best practices that we can share across those ecosystems, whether it's with the mayor's team, whether it's our business clients, um, or whether it's with the public sector that has to figure out how, how this really works and replicate and scale across the, the world. And finally, um, I joined the board of Hamdi Lokaya's TENT organization, again, because that's what he believes and that's fundamentally what TENT is, is about. And so we're working with them as others like Airbnb and uh, partners around this table is, is can we create the best practice modules for companies that want to employ vulnerable and refugees um, so that it's easier for them? Well, how do you do this? And um, what does your HR department need to know? What, what are the legal aspects of this? What are the tax issues? And, and those of us that have actually managed through some of this, what TENT is doing is, and, and we're supporting is actually going to company after company and saying, how can we help you actually do something here? Whether it's 100, whether it's 1,000, or whether it's 10,000, um, do what you can and we can help you get there. So these are new models and, um, and it, it is fun fundamentally, as I said, is, is shifting the mindset from, from the foundation to core business. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And with that thread, I might turn to um, a couple of individuals that have deep expertise in thinking about refugees and migrants as employees. So maybe starting off with you, Andrew, um, from Education for Employment, you all have supported thousands of refugees getting access to employment. So could you share some of your experience from supporting them in, in that from a different perspective than a, an investor, but rather in supporting um, refugees getting access to those livelihoods that Jay was referring to? Yeah, well, I, I, thank you, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Couldn't agree with uh, the words that uh, Jay was speaking uh, more in terms of hope, and that's really what we uh, focus on at EFE is bringing that hope through connecting youth and refugees uh, to employment opportunities. And we do that through building a network of employer partners 
um, that we've worked with over a span of 10 years. I'll use Jordan as the example. That's come up a few times in the, the Syrian uh, refugee population there. And we're really focused, of course, on those refugees that probably won't have the opportunity for uh, sponsorship or relocation of some kind. And so working to find employment opportunities on the local economy uh, and providing them with uh, livelihood opportunity. We do it both through self-employment initiatives and entrepreneurship training, um, but also by working with the local employers and building both the business case for uh, employing the refugee population and the social case. And I think what's been interesting is that the business case has actually been fairly self-evident. Um, it's not one that we've had to push hard. Syrians in Jordan are known for having particular skills. Um, it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes it's harder to get into sectors where they may not be known for having those skills, but where they are, for example, the hospitality or the um, industry or um, was speaking with an employer recently uh, about uh, bringing in some refugees into his business, which was uh, baking um, Arab sweets. Um, and uh, a restaurant that served those. Um, the attitudes that the refugee population brings into the place of employment, um, they're seen as being uh, significantly harder workers um, often than the even Jordanian counterparts that they're working with. And one employer was talking about the, the competition that that created, which was a, a positive thing. So the business case there was good. The social case is one that we continue to work on, and we believe that investing in the refugee community, investing in youth in particular, and the youth will invest in the community and create much greater social cohesion. And so we see that in terms of um, engagement in civic organizations uh, as well. I was also asked to speak just real briefly about the policy uh, environment, and, and that is an obstacle. Um, both the existence of policies to be able to hire the refugees locally, but also, as much as anything, the confusion around that policy and the lack of transparency. And part of it is just, I think there's a need for advocacy, um, but also um, the transparency because it shifts pretty quickly uh, in Jordan from month to month. Um, and so, and I think that's true across the other. So um, I'll maybe uh, bring it to a close there given the, the timing. Thanks so much. Gina, maybe I'd like to bring you in. You all have great experience also in other geographies, particularly in the United States, in supporting um, immigrants getting access to jobs. So in thinking about the kind of experience that Andrew has, how would you say that translates into other, into other geographies in terms of the case for business to employ refugees and migrants? Yeah, I think for us, I mean, we work with a lot of companies, both Fortune 500 and then more of small and medium-sized companies in the United States. And what we find is, is the best argument is, is that refugees and newcomers are good for the economy. Um, and that really they're capable of filling talent shortages and they are a talent pool that is untapped. Um, there are specific barriers and restrictions that refugees and newcomers face when they try to integrate into the workforce in the United States. And unless those barriers are addressed, such as language, such as um, you know, recogni recognition of their skills and their backgrounds, how do you value somebody's work if they or education if they graduated from the University of Baghdad? Um, and so how do we work on addressing those barriers so that they can actually become a talent pool? Um, so we sort of work with corporations to shift towards talent-based, skills-based hiring over pedigree. Um, and part of that is different tools in the toolbox. We work with Accenture, for example, um, and they've developed a portal in which our candidates are actually looked at by their diversity and inclusion staff and then sort of going through a coaching process about who Accenture is, what is the work culture, what are the job requirements for this, and then passed on to the HR if that's appropriate. Um, and what that does is it really helps address a um, professional networks, right? Because so much of us get our jobs through our professional networks and refugees and newcomers don't come with those. B, understanding workplace culture and our environment in the United States is very different, so it helps them get access to some of those resources and that input. And C, it also allows them to actually get their CVs looked at, um, whereas, you know, if you're in a competitive space, you're going to be dumped at the bo bottom of the pile because how, how do I evaluate your work experience at Unilever in, in Thailand? Um, I think the next example would be 
we work with Google on um, e-certification for IT. And part of that is really looking at, okay, how do we ensure that people have the skills at the qualification levels that we ex expect in the United States? And how do we give them access to that without having to have a four-year degree? Um, so looking at some of those certification um, in sectors where there are talent shortages. Um, and then another one is upskilling, right? So there's reskilling where people actually change their profession and their um, education in order to get a job in a very different field. But there's also upskilling where you can actually um, get new skills that you would need to compete in the market here. So for example, we work on with cybersecurity um, as a space for upskilling. It's a new market, it's growing. People who might have had an IT background um, aren't gonna be competitive and so they need a top up. Um, so we, we sort of work with um, companies and corporations to devise, to devise strategies, those are various, um, but I think the takeaway really is we do not have a workforce or hiring structure which is open to newcomers and refugees, and so that needs to change. That's fantastic, and I think we're going to hear more about the case for businesses around workforce from some of the um, other colleagues that will speak about activism. But before turning to the activism portion, I wanted to um, deep dive a little bit into the role of one particular industry in this space, which has already taken great efforts to, to use its products and to develop products that relate to refugees and migrants. And so we have two representatives from the mobile technology sector, um, Andrew Dunnett from the Vodafone Foundation and Yasmina McCarthy from GSMA. Maybe I'll start with you, Yasmina, to give us a sense of both the opportunities and the work that you all have already done and some of the constraints that you have faced in being able to, to think about your network of um, technology companies and, and what they've been able to do practically. Thank you very much, Shruti, and to Concordia for this uh, for being able to participate in what's a very important uh, topic. Um, I think the reason why uh, mobile's role humanitarian has been articulated in part because of the growing numbers uh, that we heard from UNHCR of 68 and a half million people, but in part because mobile operators are in these communities and therefore these individuals are inherently new customer segments they need to consider. Um, so the work that I do uh, leads uh, overall mobile for development, uh, which is now has an impact on 44 million people, but increasingly we're looking at what are the ways that humanitarian can better leverage mobile. And I wanted to put three uh, points to this group. Uh, first, uh, mobile is not a luxury. It is an essential part of these individual lives. And the best example we have, I think, is, is that anecdotal story of a, of a tailor, uh, somebody who stitches uh, in a refugee camp in Tanzania who shows off his smartphone proudly and says, this is how I learn new patterns, this is how I source new fabrics, and this is how I use uh, payments through mobile money. So that shows you the centrality that mobile has played now. Uh, and UNHCR estimates that some 92% of all refugees now live within mobile coverage. So this is a really important platform for us to have uh, a socioeconomic impact on people's lives. The second point I'd like to say is that the industry is ready to act, and you'll hear that, I'm sure, from Vodafone, uh, but we have so many examples now where the mobile industry is standing up and saying, how can we be a positive part in the solution? Uh, MTN using mobile money in Rwanda, uh, Zane looking at connectivity solutions in the Middle East, uh, Safaricom using pay-as-you-go solar solutions in refugee camps in Kenya. The stories continue, and I think Turkcell in uh, Turkey is a great example with Hello Hope, which actually looks at a full integration solution. The final point is the policy barriers. Uh, there's now 135 countries where a refugee may not even be able to get basic mobile connectivity due to complexities with identity documents. That filters down to mobile money, and that leads to financial exclusion, and that's a real challenge if you're trying to rebuild your life, but you don't have a safe and secure way to save or send money. Uh, so I would call on this group to identify different ways we can work together, uh, especially around that policy dimension. Uh, I want to reiterate that the sector is there and ready to drive innovation, but we need that collaboration to continue to tear down some of these policy barriers that are limiting mobile technology's full potential. Thank you. Thanks so much. Andrew, you all have deep experience in this area, also in, in the realm of financial inclusion, which, which you know, we understand can be extended and has been extended out to refugees and migrants. And so what has been your experience in using Vodafone's capabilities with refugees and migrants? <clears throat> well, I think two things. One is um, in terms of sponsorship, I mean, sponsorship in terms of fundraising, first of all, 
the, there's a uh, huge emotional connection between many of the markets in which we operate and uh, the plight of many refugees. So, uh, you know, we have an ongoing campaign with UNHCR and Help Refugees, and so there's a lot, a lot of interest there. And in different markets, you get sponsorship in terms of uh, people uh, taking the model we were just discussing uh, and doing that in an individual way. Um, I think in terms of, of the company uh, and talking about Jay's, you know, pathway to livelihood, uh, I think we see zero rating connectivity as absolutely key. So enabling uh, those who can't afford access to connectivity, uh, the three million children in refugee camps in com countries in which the company operates, uh, bringing uh, firstly connectivity, then bringing the best content, and then where possible bringing the hardware with it uh, to enable them to access. So just to give you two examples, we've got a partnership going on at the moment with UNHCR, uh, which we've been doing for four, four years now, uh, where we're doing that in, uh, in 31 schools in refugee camps, 60,000 uh, young people are learning uh, every day as a result of that program, and we're seeing impacts in terms of their learning experience and so on. Uh, but we wanted to sort of take that broader uh, and so we've uh, uh, launched an instant schools program outside of camps where we've got three, qu three quarters of a million young people learning on zero rated free e-school platforms. So, uh, and the sort of, uh, the impact you see in terms of when you go sort of like, I was in Kakuma camp recently uh, and you find a young man uh, in the camp uh, doing his accountancy exams on a free, on our free learning platform using the resource center that we set up with UNHCR, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think there are many ways, as we heard, that you can enter uh, this whole area and agenda. Um, but I think for us, uh, one of the ways we, we want to see a contribution to this, this route to livelihood is enabling people to access education, uh, the best content. It's not easy to get the best content to people um, in a link to the local curriculum, in a language that's relevant. Uh, and um, but that's where we see ourselves making a contribution. No, that's fantastic, and and there are these are great examples of the use of the private sector's core business capabilities for the path to livelihood and the path to integration of, of newcomers. So this is fantastic. Um, I'm going to now turn over to the role of businesses as advocates as CEOs coming out and saying that this is an important issue. And, and it was referred to earlier that policy barriers are one of the challenges that, that uh, businesses have to be able to use their core capabilities in this area. And there's a real case for businesses themselves beyond just their core business, but as those neutral actors to engage in this space and talk about the rationale for being welcoming to um, to various communities. Um, we have five additional speakers um, who have um, experience in this domain, um, and I'm going to start off with Jack Leslie from um, Weber Shanwick, which has done some analysis on the ways that businesses engage in this subject. And, and that clock is ticking down, and Trudy, ticking and I'm, gonna, I'm very down. conscious of it, so I'll make this very quick. We'll send you the research if I can't get to it all here. Um, yeah, we're seeing something very new. We're calling it CEO activism. Um, it didn't really exist five to ten years ago, certainly not at the level it does now. I think a lot of it is due, frankly, to some enlightened leaders that we have. I'd like to thank that or to Jim and other, Jay and others' points about embracing SDGs and all that that entails. But frankly, there's a lot of internal pressure, uh, which is a good thing, that's coming from uh, many different stakeholders, principally, by the way, from employees, um, but also from, obviously, social media and activists and media investors, Larry Fink's letter that you, that you all saw. Just to give you some quick numbers, four in 10 Americans, this are among Americans, believe that CEOs have a responsibility to speak up on important social issues. I don't think that would have been the case 10 years ago. A third say that of those who are employed, say they'll be more lawyer, loyal to their employee, mm -hmm. employer if the CEO takes an issue, takes a position on hotly contested issues. Half of Americans, believe that CEOs and business leaders can actually impact um, government policy. 77% of Americans uh, believe that CEOs have a responsibility to speak out when their values are violated or um, threatened. Um, in, in, of course, this area in immigration, we really saw it kick off. We track CEO uh, statements across all sorts of different issues. Uh, but on immigration, we all saw that uh, in, in, the, in the aftermath of the 
ban in January of 17th. Uh, companies like Facebook and Microsoft and IBM and many others really came to the fore. People like uh, H Howard Schultz, who, who um, made a pledge, you may remember at that point, um, to hire 10,000 uh, employees. Jabani Hamdi was mentioned. jabani has been a real leader in this. So we've seen a good deal on immigration and refugees. Interestingly, when you ask among all the different issues that business leaders could speak out, it's about midway down the list. Um, 38% uh, of American public believe CEOs should have a, a position on uh, immigration and refugees to give you a sense, you know, among the higher ones are uh, equal pay uh, in the workplace, 79% sexual harassment, 77% gender equality, 59% uh, and refugees and immigration still though at about 40%, which is rather significant of people who believe that companies should be speaking um, speaking out. The last thing I'd, I'd say is that um, uh, we really saw uh, this whole issue ratcheted up considerably around the family separation um, at the border. Um, we tracked uh, nearly a hundred companies um, that made strong statements um, in response to that. 70%, Seventy-seven percent of those companies did so at the CEO or the or the uh, uh, the chairman level. So um, this is getting serious attention uh, in, in the corporate world, as I said, because hopefully it's the right thing to do, but also because um, they're seeing key constituencies pressing them to do this. Absolutely, and maybe I'll turn to you, Todd. You run an organization whose focus is is bringing together these business leaders to talk about things like immigration and criminal justice reform. I imagine those statistics chime with what your lived experience is. Tell us a bit more about why you think companies are and are going to continue to engage in this way. Yeah. Um, so three big things that we've worked on at Ford.us uh, that have done this were uh, the travel ban. Um, I will also note with the travel ban, actually the first CEO was posted with Mark Zuckerberg was, was about the travel ban. It was about the ramp up in interior enforcement we were expecting. Um, the second was just huge and was as big as a family separation in terms of the numbers, although I don't know if the intensity was on DACA repeal. And the third was on family separation. So why is this the case? I think you bring up a really interesting point, Jack, that if this ranks a little bit lower, why this is so high? And this is our, one of our jobs here is to get these people, work with these people to do it. Well, the reason it happens is, I think, two things. One, um, we should understand support for refugees and immigrants is absolutely at a historic and all-time high. We have an administration who is not only in contrast to that, but we should be very clear, is intentionally, and they would describe themselves that way, um, the most oppositional of that in 100 years. And so that pre presents a contrast. It presents the sorts of policy opportunities and the opportunities for corporate activism that you have not seen in the past. Um, so our job is to help people do that, and that's pretty simple. Um, it's who, uh, who you get help, why, why you're going to help them. And then you got to explain to people what they can actually do. And I think this gets missed too often. Give people like something they can do in a meaningful fashion. So a couple months ago, I'm in a hotel. Uh, it's 119 degrees outside and we're waiting for, uh, a bus to show up from a place called Eloy. I don't know if anybody knows what Eloy is. Um, it's hell. It's a private prison. It's halfway between Tucson and Phoenix. And off comes the bus, comes a three-year-old who 45 minutes ago found out that no, despite what his parents are, uh, he'd been told his parents were not dead and his parents had not left him. He'd been told a couple things. So he walks up to this nice guy who's the bellhop at a hotel that I won't name. Uh, and I'm in the hotel because we had a corporate partnership where someone said, we'll give you cheap hotel rooms to house families who are being reunited. And he walks up to the bellhop and he says in Spanish, um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Soldier, you freed me. Um, now I get to live with you. Because he saw the little thing on the shoulder and thought it was a, somebody else. And he said, I get to live with you and my family now. I thought they were dead. And I was there because we had founders from the corporate world who cared about this mission. And when we had a track record with them and we said, here's how you can help stop this policy. And if so you can help these families, we could do it. And we found new partners, and we called United Airlines, and we called Uber, and we said, we have transportation needs, we have real needs, and I don't know how to do this. And when we dug in and we said, we're going to do this to help these people, we, we told a story about it. 
And I think that's the important thing here, is when you're doing this work and you're talking about these communities, linking it back to the policy work too. And that's what we try to focus on. And you just try to explain to people, you gotta draw a line in the sand someplace. And if you're ever gonna care about these issues, the time is now. Thank you so very much. And we've got um, two companies that have put down a line in the sand and have said things that are quite meaningful. So Airbnb, which has said many things, but also done many things in this area, as well as Uber. Um, being conscious of time, ladies. And then we also have Dinah, who's from the B team, who's gonna sort of help us close out this part of CEO activism. But starting with you, Kirsten, Airbnb, the work that you all have done here. Sure, thank you. Um, so with Airbnb, it really has come down to a values-based decision for us. Um, our mission as a company is to create a world, a world where anyone can belong anywhere. And the travel ban is a, a great example of that being in direct conflict with our mission. And so there are many hot topics that our founders and our CEOs could get involved in, but really trying to be targeted around the ones that uh, directly violate that, that, that mission. Uh, and so around the travel ban actually is when we made a pledge to help house 100,000 people through our open homes platform that are in need of temporary shelter and focus very much on refugees and newly resettled um, individuals who are coming to the US and were directly impacted by the travel ban. Uh, and then we've just looked to kind of maintain a steady drumbeat in, in terms of that advocacy. So most recently with the family separations at the border, making sure that we're vocal and, and putting pressure where we can to continue to support um, this types of policies that are protecting refugee rights. Thanks so much. Carol. As a general manager with Uber, I oversee operations in 12 of our states in the US and um, you, you may be wondering, well, what is Uber doing at the table here? Um, and you probably know that many newcomers uh, to different countries find the earning opportunities with Uber a great way to get on their own two feet financially. Um, but with actually those, those same three moments that Todd mentioned, um, we've also taken a stand for what we believe is right. And I've, I've led those efforts, um, and that, that's why I'm here today. Um, we believe that uh, the world should be more open and connected, and um, and we've been disheartened by some of the recent policies that have come out. And so, at the in these three instances, we have taken a stand. Um, first was in January of 2017 with the travel ban. Um, we contacted our drivers through the app, and we said, um, if any of you are affected by this, then um, we can help. And so we connected them with a 24/7 legal defense fund. Um, second, a few months later, um, there was the potential for the administration to rescind DACA. And so we said again, um, if any of, uh, of our drivers are affected by this, um, we're gonna connect you to that 24 seven legal defense fund again. And then most recently, well, with the family separations at the, the southern border, um, we said, that we're gonna partner with forward.us, and um, there was that real logistical need that Todd, meant, Todd mentioned. A lot of these families just needed to get around to different places, and we said, ah, we can help with that. So um, we provided free transportation and free meals through Uber Eats, um, and to date, this partnership is still going, but we've provided about 1,000 of these rides and about 100 plus meals um, in 28 cities across the US. Um, we believe that, that this is the right thing to do. Um, our CEO, Dara uh, Khazr Shahi, uh, is a, was a refugee himself. He arrived um, in the United States as a child from Iran, and, um, and we believe, like Todd said, now is the time to stand up. Thank you so very much. Dinah, over, over to you. Also, I hope to extend us out in some final words beyond the United States um, in terms of what business can do in this area. Great, thank you. Um, just speaking as a proud Canadian, um, it's been fantastic to listen to all the Canadian voices here as well as our American voices. Um, I am speaking from a European perspective. I'm part of the B team, which is a group of 25 CEOs, including um, most recently Humdi, who has just joined us, Paul Pullman, Richard Branson, the Virgin. So it's a group of CEOs who really want to raise the voice of progressive businesses. And um, refugees and migration issues are ones on which we weigh in quite uh, heavily and often. Uh, but what we have seen is that in order to be able to take a stand, your companies have to know how to walk the talk. And that is something that we have heard uh, quite a lot over in Europe. And what we have done as a result um, with the Tent Foundation, IRC, um, Virgin, and Ben and & Jerry's, we've created a little network of, um, of uh, best practice exchange um, on refugee issues. 
And I suppose that the fact is we, we realized that we had to because nobody really knows what to do on this stuff. And so they want to learn in a quiet way how to do things better. And so we're small and perfectly formed as a little network. Um, but what we do know so far in our meetings are um, a couple of things. First of all, um, what businesses need is transparent government policies that don't change. And so people know whether and how to hire refugees. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that businesses really want um, governments not to do directly um, oppositional things. For example, in the UK, um, one cannot hire refugees. They're not allowed to work, nor are they allowed to claim benefits. They're allowed to have an asylum payment of seven bucks a day, and they cannot work um, on that. I don't know how they survive. So it would be great if we were allowed to come to the table and change that. And then the last thing is, uh, to your point, um, it was interesting hearing that practical examples of what to do. There's a, a great German um, uh, a vocational education database which allows companies to sort through the, re um, the qualifications from around the world. And so just those sort of things along with la language training is what businesses are really looking for. Thank you so very much. Um, I wanted to give the last word in this session to Sana Mustafa from the Network of Refugee Voices. Um, and maybe not only your experience from your organization, but listening to this conversation, what advice would you give to businesses, both who want to be advocates or employers or provide their products and services, and indeed to the, the movement of uh, private individuals who are, who are looking to come together to do sponsorship? Um, the last word to you, Sana. Thank you. Um, I definitely had a lot of comments going on, but I will try to say a few things. Um, I mean, we heard around the table from 24 people a lot um, about part part creating partnerships for supporting refugees and immigrants. And I never heard once partnering with refugees, um, which is really problematic uh, because really nothing about us without us as refugees. Um, so I feel um, there is a call out there <laughs> to be inclusive, to be more inclusive, um, and to uh, consider refugees, um, refugees who have the right expertise in what you're trying to do as, as partners, not only as recipients. Uh, so that's the first uh, comment I would have. The second one is definitely about um, framing the story and, um, and implementing policies and projects for refugees. I think one of the reasons that we still have you know, the refugee crisis, which is not recent, I don't think, you know, the displacement issue are permanent issues, and we've been having them, you know, before the foundation of UNHCR, and we still suffer from this. And I think, if anything, that, that tells us that we're not learning. And probably we're not learning because we're not really engaging those people in, in finding solutions for their own lives. And if anything, we engage them in listening to their stories which is very symbolic. And in best case scenarios these days, you see some consultancy where you know, they ask refugees what they want, but then who implement, who makes the decision, who designs these programs are not refugees. So I feel that we, are, we, we have a um, huge expertise pool that we're not tapping into. Um, the last thing in regard to policy, I couldn't agree more about the importance of private sector uh, engagement on a policy level. I, you know, I work with private sector and on literally this issue, and so many would like to more on be apolitical and not necessarily be engaged politically on trans translating the outcomes and the obstacles they are facing to policies. And, and, and this is a huge problem. Private sector has a privilege, has the power and the money, and mainly even like the social power and the status to be engaged politically and translate whatever obstacles and they are facing into policies. You know, Jordan was mentioned a couple of times, but it's a maybe a successful example in some sense, but we know that, you know, Jordan has almost a million refugees, Syrian refugees, and they have issued only 200,000 work permits. So no matter how much we create work opportunities, no matter how much we have advocational training and all of this, there is no, refugees cannot work. So we have to work on, on work rights, we have to work on work permits, and then uh, labor conditions. Is it only about numbers? Are we here just to fulfill the numbers of how refugee, refugees we have hired? Are these refugees' lives have actually changed? Are they working minimum wage? What's the work conditions? So I think it's really maybe the question that we need to leave here. How can we do things you know, beyond the CSR and then uh, and being more inclusive? Thank you.
Well put and a great place for us to end. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to um, Concordia for bringing us together. And I wish you all a great continuation here at the conference. Thanks. Thanks for that.